the organizing committee for giving giving this opportunity and especially shares for uh, including me in this uh, IC. All right. So, uh, like uh, like mentioned, so we'll just in the next uh, five to ten uh, five to eight minutes we'll uh, we'll go through what are the diagnostic criteria for keratoconus and uh, what's the right time to treat and how to document progression in these cases. So uh, let's just go briefly about the keratoconus definition. And it's, keratoconus is a bilateral asymmetrical ectatic disease of the cornea. And it occurs due to a genetic predisposition triggered by environmental factors. Basically, it's, it's, it's like a, you, know, you can compare it with diabetes, which is a multi-genetic disorder. You don't know who's going to get. But obviously, there is some genetic predisposition. Certain associations like allergic eye disease, which is one of the most important uh, thing we ask our patient not to rub, you know. It affects one in 2,000 in US and it's at almost like four times more common in South Asian population. So uh, the best way to diagnose, not to miss keratoconus is suspect each and every case of irregular astigmatism, which is unstable and which increases over a period of time. This this was, most, mostly we use like one, whenever when, K1 and K2 is more than 48, K max more than 49. And uh, once the central pachymetry is less than 470 microns, we suspect keratoconus. But with the modern techniques and uh, instruments, mostly we rely on topography now. So any symmetric bow tie pattern is suggestive of re regular astigmatism. And any deviations from this bow tie pattern is considered, it's suspected to be uh, keratoconus. Let's, uh, th these are a few of the pictures where you can see symmetrical and asymmetrical bow tie and skewing and uh, no skewing. So there are two, do, uh, you can see, notice two cross marks. So one is, uh, one is like, it almost looks like a symmetrical bow tie, but there is some skewing. And the other one also, it's an asymmetrical bow tie, but the cornea is not very steep. These are the cases where we are actually not sure whether it's keratoconus or not. So that's why we have to move, move next to the like special, uh, uh, we, we have to look at not uh, tomo uh, topography anymore, we have to move to tomography, where we'll get the posterior elevation map. So this is a pentacam map, quad map, and you see that the anterior surface almost looks like normal, but you have a posterior elevation, which is eleva uh, posterior elevation, uh, which looks like a abnormal. And if you see the bad display, the D value is more, and in the differential map, you can see a red spot here, which again suggests there is a risk of, uh, th there is some ectatic component there. So before 2015, before this paper was uh, published, there was no, actually, there was no consensus on the diagnosis of keratoconus. There was no actual definition of keratoconus. So this was a very extensive uh, work which was done through four supranational uh, societies, cornea societies, which was Asia Cornea Society and Pan Cornea and Cornea Society, and uh, um, uh, there was uh, one more. So they agreed uh, on four, three distinctive clinical characteristics of keratoconus, which included posterior, the, which included the presence of posterior corneal ectasia, an abnormal corneal thickness spectral distribution, and it should be non-inflammatory corneal thinning condition. And they also mentioned that exact values for any parameter will depend upon the machine and the reference surface. And the values will also depend upon your indication, whether you're screening for refractive surgery or whether you're going to treat for cross-linking. So th this, the, the last two lines are very important. Uh, the values differ totally when you're doing screening or when you're doing refractive surgeries. Then came, uh, then the subclinical keratoconus was also defined here, and they, they pointed, the consensus was tomography is the best and the most widely available test to diagnose, and uh, uh, mostly through same flug uh, imaging and optical coherence topography. And posterior corneal, corneal elevation was, must be, uh, abnormality must be present. Central pachymetry is the least reliable method for diagnosing keratoconus, which is still used at many places. This was a very old classification system which was uh, introduced in 1947 and still being used at some places, but it's, it's hardly of any use to us. It doesn't give any, it doesn't give any idea about the posterior data and also uh, the subclinical disease can easily be missed, almost more than 90% you'll miss. Then the Berlin came with this new classification system which was called ABCD. And the advantage here was it, it, it doesn't take a data from one point, whereas it takes a data from 3mm zone which was centered on the thinnest point uh, thinnest point as this area represents ectatic zone better than the single point parameter like Kmax. So you have A which represents the anterior radius of curvature around the 3mm zone, B the posterior uh, radius of curvature at the 3mm zone and the PACI and the best corrected visual acuity. There are different modalities to again 
uh, diagnose uh, keratoconus. We'll not go into the detail. I'll just go, what are the newer uh, uh, things which has come in the last uh, couple of years? And uh, so the score, this was a work done by Cordelia Chan from Singapore National Eye Center. And she compared, uh, this was a multi-centric trial, and she compared score, which is the screening corneal objective risk of ectasia analyzer with uh, ectasia risk scoring system, which was already there, and the percentage of tissue ablation, which is uh, which was also there. So she uh, she uh, they, they found out that the best specificity for predicting the risk of ectasia was the score, and ERS ERSS has the best sensitivity. Where PTA required they they they, they found out that PTA required more validation studies. So this was a typical uh, score uh, uh, picture looks like. You see a negative score. That means there is no risk of ectasia here. And uh, here, if you see uh, the left, the right eye shows some uh, 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 frank ectasia, whereas the left eye doesn't show. But if you see the score for the right eye, it comes 1.1, which is positive. And so there was a risk of uh, ectasia in this eye, and you'll not touch this eye. Pentacam is a quad map, and uh, um, I, I'm sure most of us know how to interpret this. I'll just go through the concept of best fit sphere, which will help us in understanding bad a little bit. So there are two types of best fit spheres, standard best fit sphere and enhanced best fit sphere. You see the you, uh, the, re, uh, the remarkable difference. The standard, uh, the enhanced best fit sphere doesn't include the cone, whereas the standard best fit sphere almost includes the cone. So uh, BAD, we also know about it. It's a screening tool, and uh, it gives, uh, it has a very good specificity and sensitivity. So this is a typical BAD uh, display looks like. On the left side, it gives the elevation data, whereas on the right side, it gives the pachymetry data. If you see the anterior elevation map, there, there's hardly any uh, hardly any signs of ectasia, hardly any signs of elevation. Whereas if you see the differential map, you see a red spot here, which will again gives the idea that it's, it looks like a from a first keratoconus. We know weaker corneas are biomechanical weaker, and uh, uh, corneal hysteresis and corneal resistance factor will be lower in keratoconus compared to normal uh, corneas. So again, this uh, CBI came and uh, the corneal biomechanical index. Uh, which, which again shows more deformation in keratoconic corneas compared to normal corneas. Here you can see this is a normal cornea and the, this is a keratoconic cornea. The def deformation amplitude here is more than the uh, normal cornea. And then after that, uh, uh, when uh, uh, Corvus ST was combined with Pentacam, uh, we could get a tomographic biomechanical index and, and it is claimed to be one of the most accurate way of detecting ectasia than any other parameters. A cutoff value of 3.35 uh, correctly classified all ectasia cases from Formifus to Frank Keratoconus. This is a display, typical display where it gives you CBI, TBI, and bad D all together. If you see the map, there's no signs of uh, ectasia here, but if you see the uh, TBI, which is uh, quite elevated here. Epithelial mapping is again another tool to diagnose early keratoconus. Uh, uh, we are still, uh, it's, it's still evolving and we are not still sure but so there are some papers from Reinstein which says it's a quite effective way of diagnosing early keratoconus. Let's come to progression. Again, before that uh, paper came in 2015 on global consensus of keratoconus, there was not a definite, there was actually no definition for what is progression. So uh, all these uh, panelists agreed on few things which define progressions. So there should be a consistent, ch consistent change in at least two of the following parameters, steepening of the anterior corneal surface, steepening of the posterior corneal surface, and thinning or an increase in the rate of corneal thickness change from periphery to the thinnest point. Changes need to be consistent and above the normal variability, which is noise of the measurement system. We'll go through it. The most important thing is whenever you're doing the mapping, you should be using the same machines and also uh, also keep in mind when you're doing a younger, uh, when you're evaluating younger patients, you should be doing the sort of, it should be usually three to four months rather than six months evaluation should be there. These are all the parameters for progression which are used in cross-linking trials, but uh, uh, importantly, none of them have been validated. So the most common one is used is K-Max and the corneal pachymetry, but none of them has been uh, validated. So again, the Berlin, the purpose uh, Berlin came with ABCD classification was to document progression. And uh, uh, the, right now, uh, ABCD displays only comes in, penta in Pentacam. And uh, we'll go through the map. So these are, this is a progression map. And uh, uh, so the A, B, C, you can, like we discussed here. And uh, uh, you can see all these bars. The, the baseline is the first one. And then all these are the next follow-up uh, parameters. Uh, you can have eight uh, simultaneous, eight, eight consecutive e examination in this. And the bars, the dashed line and the solid line, which you see here is 
uh, confidence interval, so 80 and 95 confidence interval. Usually what Bellin recommends is if either A, B or C is more than 95% of conf uh, more than 95% uh, confidence interval for normal population that means it's a definite uh, progression or if it is two parameters more than 80 percent then again it's a uh, definite progression more importantly you have to it's uh, it's 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 in actually we have to decide whether you want to compare it with 95 percent confidence interval or 80 percent it's depend upon your experience and the population thank you i think this is uh, uh, the next time i didn't go into the treatment i think that the next consecutive uh, speakers will yeah Talk about that. Uh, thanks a lot, Ashish, uh, for extensively covering this. I mean, e essentially, one of the challenges is even today, after diagnosing keratoconus, is really knowing when to treat. Use a certain amount of cylinder. So you may have a patient where the overall spherical equivalent might appear nearly the same, but the cylinder might be higher, where measured indicates the topography measured one, and the refraction is your subjective refraction. For topography guided treatments, we tend to go towards more of the topography guided refraction, but we have to keep in mind that the overall spherical equivalent should not be changed uh, beyond what the patient is objecti uh, accepting subjectively, especially if the patient has a good BCVA with whatever the subjective acceptance is. So the first and foremost step is to set the uh, power is at zero before you decide whatever you're going to correct. Set the power at zero and look at the zero ablation profile. So when you're looking at the zero ablation profile, you can see that here the uh, area where you're getting the maximum ablation is centered over the area which is maximally elevated on the anterior sagittal curvature and the area above this is flat. So you have this arc-like mid-peripheral ablation which is going to uh, give you an ablation over the mid-periphery and thereby steepen this cornea and flatten this cornea giving rise to a more anteriorly normalized surface. So this correlating this zero powered map is most important and only if this is matching well with your topography should you go ahead with the treatment. Next, the idea once you have uh, trying to do a topography you can try and debulk the cylinder. Now while debulking the cylinder the magnitude can be taken from the uh, uh, topography you are trying to reduce the magnitude and even though in some cases it might actually be higher than what the patient is accepting subjectively. We are going clo uh, more and more towards the topography refraction especially when it comes to these keratoconic patients and you might add a cylindrical power which might actually be higher than what the patient is accepting but lower than what the topography says is the cylinder. Now in some cases you may have good correlation where it becomes quite easy to decide where the subjective cylinder and the topographic axis are very well matched as in this case and then it's a no brainer uh, with regards to uh, uh, what axis you're going to choose. But when it is quite different uh, as in the subsequent case as you can see here it's 100 and 165 so widely apart we tend to shift towards the topographic cylinder. But before you go in with the uh, whatever the machine is suggesting, have a look at the anterior float and look at the axis of the steep axis of the cylinder on the anterior float. As you can see here, if you connect the steepest point with the central point and draw a line, it is going towards the 160 mark as opposed to the 100 mark which your subjective, uh, subjectively which the patient is accepting. So while looking at the anterior float is one of the best guides to see along the axis where you are correcting and as long as it's closer you have an additional validation to say that you are treating along the 165 axis and that's what is happening in this patient. How much do you correct the s s uh, sphere? So as long as you are keeping your ablation depth between 50 to 60 microns is where you are doing. You can also bring down the optic zone size from your standard 6 or 6.5 to 5.5 millimeter which also reduces your amount of ablation and you can keep adjusting the cylinder till you reach uh, somewhere between 50 to 60 microns. An additional thing you can do is also add a small amount of hyperopia which many of your patients if you carefully refract you know, will accept and uh, this patient even on uh, subjective refraction is uh, accepting a small amount of hyperopia. You would do well to add that hyperopia here because cross-linking itself is going to add a little bit more flattening and will uh, have a sudden uh, subtle shift towards it. So if you do that plus one, from your 56 micron, your central maximum ablation has already come down to 50 micron as more ablation is being added to the mid uh, periphery and your central ablation actually starts coming down. So this is an addi additional small tip that you can use to slightly uh, reduce your amount of ablation depth in the center. 
So just running through a quick examples which before I close. Uh, this is the example which we were working on. I was uh, sh uh, showing you the planning. Uh, the pre-op vision uncorrected is 636, BCVA of 69. The post-operatively uh, post patient has a 66 parts vision and with just about 0.5 adapter cylinder improves to 66. This is an example of a centered cone where you can see on the posterior float, the point is very much within the central 3 millimeter zones, the most elevated areas. And these patients do extremely well with good 66 vision. But even in patients with decentered cone, as you can see here, where majority of the cone is outside the 3 millimeter zone, even many of these patients do well. These are again patients with good pachymetry, where you are able to uh, reduce it, debulk it, and you have a much more symmetric cornea, and the v visual acuity also improves. Yes, you do have a residual cylinder on your astigmatism. The patients markedly improve in their uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity. This is again some examples just showing the curvature, much greater symmetry once the procedure is done. In these very central nipple cones, in the post-operative, just if you look at the axial curvature without looking at the posterior cornea, you won't even know that they had keratoconus to begin with. This is how well we do a careful step-by-step -step planning, how well uh, topo-guided PRK can work in these patients. Quick point about whether manual epithelectomy versus PTK. Uh, one of the things is the challenges which continue to remain is we are not able to have lasers which really map the epithelial thickness which varies from center to periphery. And that is the problem in keratoconus where epithelium can to some extent mask the cone. So if you have a topography where you've taken with the epithelium on but manually remove the epithelium which is variable from center to periphery and you have a slightly altered topography on which you're treating the cornea. For that possibly a PTK might be better where you're removing a uniform 50 micron or 40 microns over the entire uh, treatment zone and then you have a topography which kind of mimics what you had uh, measured before your epithelium was removed and that is possibly what works really well in these cases. We still have a lot of unanswered questions. How much ectasia? What should be the uh, maximum at, uh, attempted correction or ablation? And then what is the dosage of CXL to be administered? Especially with the advent of customized cross-linking, how do you combine what nomograms do we follow? It's still an evolving science, but exciting days for these mild to moderate keratoconus, where a number of them can be rehabilitated extremely well, only in early keratoconus, just to uh, reiterate. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Any questions? Any quick questions? questions? I think uh, well, maybe one question and one comment. Yes. Uh, uh, in patients who are relatively young, below 18 years, though it's quite okay to do a PRK or the cross-linking, uh, do you think it's a good idea to avoid doing it because they might require a repeat procedure later on or do you think you have no age cutoff? Sir, so I've not treated pre-teens, uh, but teenagers, uh, I mean like uh, between uh, uh, 14 to 18, we have been treating and uh, for most of these patients, I now have a five-year follow-up. Yes, uh, there are patients, very, very rarely, where uh, in reported in uh, literature, uh, pediatric cases who've been treated early in cross-link have required a repeat cross-link procedure. But looking at our data, I'm not sure in uh, LVP as well, sir, how many patients have actually required a repeat cross-linking, which is not very, very, very common. These patients, however, are regularly followed. We have uh, a post-operative scan at two or three months done, which is the baseline scan. And every time it is uh, documented and we follow them up. And if necessary, yes, a repeat cross-linking will have to be done. I'm not sure if the topo-guided PRK itself may increase the risk of uh, progression. Uh, do you uh, do this uh, in a patient who is having 6-6 six, six vision? So, corrected. yes, yes, 6-6 uh, six, six best corrected. Now, uh, again, a lot of these patients may uh, read 6-6 six, six on your Snellens chart. Uh, obviously, if it's uncorrected, I wouldn't do anything. I would. They are probably very well adapted to their cone and I would just go ahead and just do a cross-linking. But best corrected 6-6, six, six. a number of these patients who are 6-6 six, six best corrected, as long as it's a, a good planning and a, a good uh, a treatment which has been done following the basic principles, their overall quality of vision does go up. Their higher order aberration profile, if you do believe in it, also does improve and uh, it does have an impact in their overall quality of vision. Definitely, their uncorrected visual acuity does improve. Even if their BCVA obviously will continue to remain only 6'6 and is not going to go better. But their uncorrected visual acuity and overall quality of vision does improve. 
again that that debate remains even for cross linking itself there are a small percentage of patients who do develop haze after cross linking so would you cross link a patient who has 66 vision as of today i don't think we are using vision as a criteria for cross linking even when we are talking about progression and age those are the more important criteria than vision itself you there are it's not uncommon to see patients with uh, keratometry as this can be uh, obtained the difference is in their cross section and the placement in the cornea the closer they are to the pupil the more flattening they will induce but the cross section has to be chosen in a manner so that the visual side effects are limited the thicker the rings are, the more flattening they will induce. Now, intracordial ring segments have often been thought of as something that can be done, but not something that everybody who treats keratoconus uses. We've had a very good experience with intracordial ring segments, and this is a paper that actually helps you understand why intracordial ring segments work well. Uh, Dr. Cynthia Roberts has given a hypothesis that the ectasia, whether it is post-LASIK or keratoconic, is caused by a focal problem. It's a focal biomechanical weakness. When the, there's a focal biomechanical weakness, you have an area which has a lower elastic modulus. This area tends to deform and then it becomes thinner. A thinner uh, cornea becomes steeper. So there is a cycle of stress redistribution. The peripheral area or the area which is not a part of this focal point may be normal. So this stress redistribution causes a perpetuation of the ectasia. So I'll just highlight a case which really helped me um, understand why the intax is something that we should all ad adopt. This is a lady who's come to us with post-LASIK ectasia, which was uh, post-pregnancy. You see her scan, the ectasia was not very much. And she was during her pregnancy and it was progressing. So we had done a simple cross-linking for her post her pregnancy. This is the first pregnancy. This is her in her second pregnancy. So despite cross-linking, the ectasia has actually progressed. This is her other eye. So her other eye had more advanced ectasia. And I had taken her up for cross-linking plus intact in this eye. So this is her eye in her first pregnancy and this is the eye in the second pregnancy. So you see that you have the same patient, one eye pure cross-linking, one eye intax plus cross-linking. So intax not only helps you with visual rehabilitation, it is perhaps playing a very important role in redistributing the stress of the focal point and making your cornea stronger. So it is a very important adjunct. And especially in cases of post-LASIK ectasia where cross-linking is in itself not sometimes as efficacious as it would be in keratoconus, intacts are important adjuncts. We normally use intacts in patients of moderate keratoconus. If a patient has very good vision like 6'6 six, six or 6'9 with glasses, these patients may actually lose some vision with intrastromal rig segment. So choose patients who have vision which is not improving beyond 612 with glasses. They have to have central clear corneas and a thickness of at least 450 microns at the proposed incision site. How do you select the segment? If you have a central cone, you have to depress it from both sides and flatten the central area. So you will choose two equally thick segments. If you have an eccentric, uh, eccentric that, uh, okay, asymmetric segments are normally therefore done in central cones. A way to find out if the cone is central is that the posterior float elevation highest point would be within the central 3, 3 mm and classically the spherical power will be more than the cylindrical power. So this is a, a case where you see we are using two symmetric segments. Asymmetric segments are used when the posterior float uh, elevation point is outside the 3 mm zone. This is classically a more eccentric cone where you need to depress the, uh, you need to flatten the cornea more with a thicker segment which is in the area of maximal ectasia and there could be a supporting thinner segment or only one segment. So in such, an, uh, such a case, normally the cylindrical power is more because it's an eccentric cone. The, uh, this is an example of that. The preoperative workup also requires you to do a very good refraction and the axis of the cylinder must be clear. Why that is so is because the spherical equivalent that you get by refraction is going to determine the thickness of the segment that you're going to use. And the axis that you get by refraction is going to determine the incision axis. 
Now this is a short surgery. We normally use the femtosecond laser to create the channels and most of the complications which were listed earlier, it's not playing so I think in the interest of time I'll skip it. We'll uh, just go over a few cases now. This is a 22 year old female. You see that she has a refraction of minus 1.5 sphere with minus 3.75 cylinder. But to calculate for the intact, you must transpose it in a form that the cylinder is in the positive connotation. So after transposition, it is minus 5 sphere plus 3.5 cylinder. So such a case would require symmetric segments because the spherical component is more than the cylindrical component. The axis of sim case steep axis is 116 and the axis of positive cylinder is 120. Normally, if your refraction is accurate, you will always choose the refractive axis for the site of incision. If the cone is more advanced and you feel you are not very sure about your refraction because you get a lot of scissoring and you can't accurately predict the axis, then you go by the topometric uh, steep axis. So this is the plan for this patient. Sphere component was larger, remember? So we are using symmetric segments. And this is the patient post-operatively. And this is the difference map with post-operative BCVA improving to 6-9. This is a patient who has had keratoconus and has been cross-linked. You can normally go for a segment which is one segment thicker post cross-linking because you expect a cross-linked cornea to actually flatten less. You should ideally do the intact segment with cross-linking or before cross-linking. We normally do it with cross-linking because that gives the maximal effect and convenience to the patient. This patient again has a higher cylindrical component and a more peripheral cone and therefore an asymmetric segment or a single thick segment placed inferiorly will work very well. This is the difference map showing that the patient actually moves to a BCV of 6 by 6 with glasses. Another patient where you see that there is a very advanced cone and there is a high amount of spherical equivalent. Such a patient benefits from the SK or the severe keratoconus segment. This is the thickest segment that is available and two thickest segments are put in to give the maximum flattening effect. And you see there's a very significant flattening in the difference map. And the astigmatism has moved from 5.4 to 1.1. Now while we try to decode it in terms of mathematics, unfortunately, the algorithms are not like LASIK algorithms. They are not mathematics. So you will expect you some improvement but some patients will improve more than others some patients will improve in six months and some patients will continue to improve even up to two years so it's not as mathematical as a laser vision correction but it is something that gives great benefit this is a post lasik ectasia patient where normally a single segment does suffice this is a 0.5 sk segment that has been implanted here now like all cases uh, icrs also has complications and a range of 1 to 35 percent has been reported. In fact, when I entered my residency at RP Center, I said, do we do uh, intrastromal ring segments? They said, we've tried it. They cause a lot of complications, and we shall never do it again. So I never saw any intrastromal ring segments in my residency. But then we moved on, and we had a different experience. So I think we can all learn. And with the Femto platform and choosing the right case, you get very good results. Complications are usu usually easily handled. For, uh, you must make sure that you insert it correctly. Do not c create a false passage. We've had cases where we have created a false passage. I think the videos are not playing. This is the post-operative patient where we've actually perforated the cornea. The intacts, instead of being intrastromal, is in, in the anterior chamber. But the cornea is most forgiving, and you can retrieve it simply by just going into the AC and removing the intact segment. This is what the patient looks like post-operatively. Sometimes you have an overlying stromal melt. If you have put the intact segment deep enough, and distal to this incision site. Must put it about 2 mm into the incision site to avoid extrusion. And you must put it at about 70 to 80% of the depth. Also, ideally, both the tips of the rings should not touch each other. Because when they touch each other, they sometimes cause some torque, which will cause the twisting and the upward migration of the intacts and increase the chances of stromal melt. So both the segments have to be apart. This is the patient where you see there is an overlying stromal melt and there is some vascularization that is coming in. 
such a case which is not responding, there has an excessive white cell reaction which is not uh, uh, resolving with steroids. We decided to remove the intact segment. The inferior segment was the one which was melted. So when we remove the inferior one, the superior was just the supporting segment. So we had to remove that also. But what was really unique was that when we removed this segment after a year, the flattening did not rebound because possibly the scarring and the tissue modulation around that had caused some degree of permanent change and the patient continues to do well. Keratitis is something we have seen and must be treated as an emergency. And uh, however, you must distinguish sterile deposits which are commonly seen along these channels. They can be inflammatory white cell sterile deposits responding to steroids. You may also have lipid and calcium deposits for which you really don't have to do anything much. This is a white cell reaction with steroid response. In conclusion, uh, intracordial ring segments are very useful in the management of keratoconus and especially post lasik ectasias. Complications need to be identified and treated early and you'll ha of ha often have very happy patients who you can offer a great amount of visual rehabilitation and actually help with reducing their progression also in cases of post lasik ectasia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ritika, for that uh, extensive presentation on intacts. While I uh, request Dr. Shreesh Kumar to set up so for this opportunity. So I am going to talk about uh, fake kaivols in keratoconus. Uh, before uh, implanting a fake kaivol, uh, uh, we should address uh, certain issues uh, like uh, whether the keratoconus is stabilized or if the cone is centered or decentered cone. If at all it is a decentered cone, it has to be centered to improve the uh, visual acuity. And uh, then you can go ahead and uh, implant a fake kaivoil to <coughs> improve the uh, visual acuity for residual refractive error. So, uh, fake kaivoils in keratoconus is, uh, is off level use uh, and uh, to correct the refractive error. Uh, and it corrects only uh, spherical and astigmatic error. Uh, it won't correct uh, higher order operations, uh, which uh, in most of the cases of keratoconus we see. Uh, it's mostly a coma and spherical errors uh, uh, we see in these patients. It won't be addressed by fake eye oils. Uh, and success of fake eye oil requires a knowledge of keratoconus progression. If it is a progressive keratoconus, we should not implant a fake eye oil in this patient because of change of refraction and uh, the patient will end up having a residual refractive error even after a uh, fake oil implantation. Uh, as such, we do not have any guidelines as to how to go about managing these patients uh, and uh, when to implant a uh, 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 fake oil in these patients uh, with keratoconus. Uh, however, with the experience uh, gained over the years, uh, uh, we can choose our patients uh, for uh, uh, fake oils. Uh, and uh, it is uh, like if the case is a stable keratoconus uh, and it is a centered, keto uh, centered cone and for the residual refractive errors you can go ahead and uh, implant a fake eye oil. If it is a stable keratoconus but a decentered cone, you have to center the cone by a uh, intracornal ring segment and if at all the uh, residual error is significant then you can go ahead and implant a fake eye oil. In case of unstable uh, keratoconus, if it is a, a not a stable keratoconus, then you have to stabilize this uh, keratoconus. If it is a centered cone, then you do a CXL. If there is a significant refractive error, go ahead and uh, implant a fake eye oil. And if it is a decentered cone, if it is a significant decentered cone, we can combine ICRS implant uh, intracornal ring segment and CXL. Then for the residual error, you can go ahead and uh, implant fake eye oils. And it's a decentered cone with the uh, significant higher order aberrations. You can combine uh, topo guided PRK uh, with CXL. And then for the residual error, we can implant a fake eye oil. So I'm just going to show a few case examples uh, wherein we have uh, implanted uh, fake eye oil. Uh, 
is a case of a 26 years old female who had a residual refractive error of 3.75 diopters of sphere and 3 diopters of uh, cylinder uh, improving up to 6 by 6 uh, and the case of uh, C3R post C3R the patient had undergone C3R five years back and now she has come back for uh, uh, refractive error correction and uh, this is her topography even though it's a decentered cone she was able to see 6 by 6 uh, with correction so uh, we went ahead with the and this is uh, the thickness was 490 and the ac depth was uh, 3.75 this is a good case for uh, phakic eye oil implantation we went ahead with phakic uh, uh, toric ipcl and uh, the patient improved to 6 by 6 uh, plano another case of keratoconus uh, the refractive error is minus 3 diopters of cylinder but the patient was not improving beyond 6 12 parts uh, and that is mainly because of the significant uh, astigmatism uh, the patient was having this is almost 10.1 uh, diopter of astigmatism even though it's not a decentered cone it is a slightly decentered cone but it's a significant uh, irregular astigmatism we went ahead with the uh, intact with the CXL in this particular patient uh, that was done uh, and uh, postoperatively you can see uh, after seven months there is a slightly centered cone and uh, the visual acuity has improved to six by six uh, with the correction so the patient was not accepting uh, a cylinder uh, in the first place now she uh, was accepting a cylinder uh, minus 4.5 adapters of cylinder she was seeing uh, six by six and uh, for the residual refractive error uh, we uh, went ahead with the <coughs> toric ipcl and uh, after uh, six weeks uh, it was uh, six by uh, seven point five uh, this was the same patient uh, the next case is uh, a patient with six by six unaided vision and uh, improving up to six twenty four the patient was not improving beyond 24, 624. The cylinder was only, uh, the patient was accepting only 1.25 adapters of cylinder. This is one of old patient, uh, uh, almost 10 years back, uh, uh, <coughs> we have implanted a uh, ICRS in this particular patient. Uh, this patient uh, had a significant uh, irregular astigmatism in the central uh, uh, 3 millimeter zone. Uh, and uh, we went ahead and planned uh, ICRS for this patient. Uh, you can see here this is a, <coughs> a, uh, a decentered cone here and uh, we put uh, two segments uh, and after uh, intax plus cxl the visual acuity has improved to six by nine and uh, uh, cylindrical uh, power error reduced to minus two adapters uh, and uh, the patient wanted further uh, correction uh, and then we planned uh, I toric IPCL in this particular patient. Uh, this is a post uh, intax uh, <coughs> fake eye implantation. I am not showing the <coughs> procedure. This is nothing uh, different from the regular fake eye implantation, but uh, maybe it is little difficult to uh, tuck the haptics uh, under the iris because uh, these ring segments uh, come in way of uh, visualization. This is a post uh, toric uh, ICL implantation, and uh, the patient has improved to 6 by 9 parts uh, plano after uh, TICL and uh, Intax plus CXL. Another case uh, example this particular patient uh, had a significant cylinder here, it is 5 adapters of spherical error and minus 6 uh, adapters of cylindrical error, improving up to 618. The other eye also early keratoconus. <coughs> This is advanced uh, keratoconus and uh, this is a decentered cone uh, and the patient had a scar in the apical <coughs> region, apical uh, apex of the cone and uh, this particular patient we went ahead with the DALC. The patient underwent a DALC uh, four quadrant uh, technique uh, which I use. Uh, so in this particular patient if the uh, cornea has a scar, it's better to avoid intacts, uh, even though the peripheral cornea was uh, adequate. Uh, <coughs> a 
post talk after all the sutures were removed uh, the patient had a residual error of minus 3 diopters of cylinder and 2.75 diopters of uh, uh, spherical error uh, and improving up to 6 by 6 parts and uh, this particular patient uh, uh, wanted a refractive correction i could have either gone ahead with the um, prk or uh, the patient uh, wanted a implantation so i went ahead with the uh, <coughs> toric uh, ICL implantation in this particular patient. Again, uh, visualization of the periphery, that is uh, the haptics, uh, will be a little difficult. Uh, and uh, post-operatively, after six months, the visual acuity was six by six parts with a small cylinder of uh, uh, 0.5 diopters. The last case, uh, uh, post C3 or ectasia, this particular patient uh, had ectasia after uh, C3 R and uh, this was her uh, <coughs> uh, refractive error, uh, 6 diopters of spherical error and minus 4.25 diopters of cylindrical error. Uh, it was a progressive ectasia after uh, uh, C3 R uh, and improving up to 624, uh, a decentered cone. Uh, I actually should have planned uh, repeat uh, C3R and uh, Intax, but I went ahead with Intax alone in this patient. Uh, and after Intax, at uh, seven months, uh, she had improved to 612 uh, <coughs> with six diopters of uh, spherical error and uh, two diopters of cylindrical error. And after two years, uh, the patient had improved uh, to 69. Uh, the refractive error did not uh, progress, so. And the, it, is, it was almost stable. The <coughs> ectasia has stopped uh, uh, without uh, doing a repeat C3R. Uh, and uh, the centered cone, I went ahead with the ICL, toric uh, IPCL. Uh, and this was the final outcome, 6 by 9 parts. Uh, and 6 weeks post-op, uh, we have yet to follow her up. Uh, So uh, there are various studies which have uh, uh, studied uh, the outcome of fakie chiovils in keratoconus, uh, and uh, uh, the result uh, are encouraging. And it is a safe procedure with a high safety index. Uh, uh, that means the safety index is nothing but the mean postoperative best spherical corrected visual acuity divided by mean preoperative best spherical uh, corrected visual acuity. It should be always more than one and uh, it is more than one here and the net gain of one uh, 12 to 14 percent uh, visual acuity <coughs> uh, from uh, before uh, 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 surgery and uh, after fecal implantation and it's effective again uh, there are various studies uh, published in jcrs and clinical experimental ophthalmology and uh, the efficacy index uh, is more than one uh, so it's a uh, highly effective and it's safe uh, in patients uh, with the keratoconus uh, uh, however, uh, this is one of my case, uh, uh, this particular patient uh, ended up with a high vault, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, shallow antechamber, sorry, I don't have an anti-segment OCT picture of this patient, this is a high vault, uh, and uh, sometimes this can happen, uh, uh, there can be a measurement uh, uh, of <coughs> problem with the measurement if the cone is central or it's a oval cone and uh, we are measuring a deep anterior chamber in the center so based on that uh, parameter if you order the lens uh, you may end up having a high vault so this is a high vault uh, and uh, it needed uh, <coughs> the same case uh, so otherwise if you leave it uh, the patient can uh, develop secondary uh, angle closure glaucoma or uh, peripheral anterior synechia and this particular patient needed explantation and uh, re-implantation of uh, uh, new uh, uh, ICL, toric ICL. Uh, I had to explant uh, this <coughs> lens, this is a large sized lens, uh, to replace it with a smaller sized uh, lens uh, with a low implant, uh, low vault. It is uh, easy, it's highly flexible, easy to explant it. Uh, without uh, enlarging the incision uh, and uh, injected a new <coughs> toric ICL.
there are various studies uh, which have uh, uh, published uh, uh, recently uh, and um, they suggest even if it is uh, 100 microns of uh, vaulting it is sufficient uh, it will not cause any uh, cataract uh, so uh, we can aim for a, a lower vaulting in these patients with the uh, central cone or a oval cone in the center uh, and uh, to conclude uh, with accurate measurements, preoperative measurements and uh, proper case selections, uh, we can uh, uh, give perfect vision in these patients and the quality of vision is much better uh, because we are going to preserve the accommodation and uh, corneal sphericity is maintained. There are various publications which have published, uh, which have shown that uh, there is a significant gain in uh, visual acuity by one or two lines. These are some of the patients uh, who gained uh, uh, one or two lines of visual acuity following uh, uh, fake eye oil implantation after, uh, in a keratoconus patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for a wide... Uh... ...ask me to speak on DALC and keratoconus. So, uh, I'm going to divide my presentation into uh, four basic segments. Number one is talk about case selection when you would like to do DALC in cases of keratoconus. Then spend some time on the different steps of DALC. A uh, little bit about special situations in DALC and keratoconus. And then at the end, how you will manage post-DALC astigmatism following keratoconus. Uh, so, firstly, uh, what we need to talk about is the algorithm at what stage you will consider DALC in somebody who has keratoconus. Since this is the last presentation, this is the algorithm I usually follow. Uh, if you have somebody who has keratoconus, you need to distinguish if it is a progressive or a non-progressive keratoconus. Uh, again, if the patient is a non-progressive keratoconus but good vision with glasses or contact lenses, uh, then you will potentially prescribe glasses or contact lenses. If it is stable, you will probably do a fakey kai well like Dr. Sharish Kumar mentioned. If the vision is not good, obvious choice is to do a uh, contact lens uh, like Dr. Chirag mentioned. And if the contact lens uh, is uh, not fitting well or the patient is intolerant like Dr. Ritika mentioned, you can do an intax for patients like this. But if you have an advanced keratoconus where none of these work, that is when you go ahead and do a PK or a DALC. Uh, if you have progressive keratoconus, like right in the beginning, like Dr. Ashish mentioned, pachymetry is good, like uh, Shreyas mentioned, then you can do a collagen cross-linking with a PRK. So this is potentially the protocol that you could follow when you see somebody who has keratoconus. So what is important in the surgical planning for somebody that you're going to do a dark surgery in keratoconus? What is important is to know if the endothelium is normal because keratoconus generally tends to have lower cell counts than normal patients, especially if they've had a high drops, then you'll have a drop in endothelial cell count. You need to know that. You need to know what level the scar extends to. You can do an OCT, but usually a slit lamp examination will suffice. And you need to also understand if dissection is feasible in cases like this, if you need to do a PK. And previous history, like a previous cross-linking, is very important to know because that also will change your approach, the ease with which you'll get your bubble. And you can also determine which dissection technique you should use during your surgery. Other important things to also consider is the age. Generally, between DALC and PK, the outcomes are relatively similar in patients who are younger. But in patients who are older, which is obviously a keratoconus, DALC tends to score over PK in a number of ways. So if you have somebody with poor spectacle uh, or contact lenses corrected vision, not amenable to cross-linking, or somebody who has a central scar, or somebody who is unwilling to use contact lenses, and also somebody who has good spectacle vision in the other eye, because we found that patients who have good vision in one eye are unwilling to use contact lenses in the other eye, and they're much happier with the procedure that gives them a definitive result than something that is midway. This is early keratoconus. Usually, surgery in these cases is relatively easy. But if you have somebody with relatively advanced keratoconus where the cone is very large, you need to ensure that your planning includes the entire area of the cone and do a sufficiently large graft so that your outcome is quite good. Again, cases like this, usually the uh, surgery is relatively straightforward. You get very good results. But in cases of post high drops, here is again where uh, I differ. A lot of people say that post high drops, you can do DALC. Uh, DALC typically is uh, more challenging post high drops. You also have lower endothelial cell count, so probably is not the go-to procedure. Maybe you should be doing a PK because post DALC, if you have a scar like this, like you see in the slit lamp here, even if you do a DALC using a manual dissection, you will typically leave behind 
some amount of residual scar and this is typically in the central visual axis. So this is uh, potentially reducing the vision of the patient and it's better that you actually do a PK which has relatively good success in cases like this again. So very quickly I'll go through the different steps that are involved in DALC, uh, a very basic again. Uh, what I like to do is uh, I like to use a vacuum trifine uh, and try and do a trephination but before I do that I usually mark the center of the cornea because like you'll see later centration is really important in keratoconus to ensure that you get a large enough graft and to ensure that you get all the cone. I use a coronet vacuum trifine because these seem to be extremely sharp and once you uh, center it on the area that you've marked and you move it forward a certain number of times then you will get a relatively uh, good area of trephination. Ensure that you don't perforate because this again will defeat the whole purpose of doing dal and you need to trephinate deep enough so that you know that you have a good ledge that you can put sutures into. Second step is debulking the stroma. So this again I found helps quite a bit because you're, when you inject your air bubble, you are in your posterior stroma and you have a higher chance of getting an air bubble. Uh, this I avoid doing if I have a scar that is going quite deep because if you have a scar then you, when you debulk, you will reach right up to the dress maze and you actually can cause a perforation. Next step is injecting of the air bubble. I use a blunt dissector or a pointed dissector to actually go and make a channel within the stroma. And then I use a regular viscoelastic cannula to go and inject air using a 2cc syringe into the stroma. Obviously we show our best cases, so this is an ideal bubble that is developing. Uh, you can see that the bubble is developing in the center really slowly and as you keep injecting it moves very nicely right up to the periphery. Typically the bubble will in increase in size to about 8 to 8.5 millimeters and you shouldn't try to enlarge the size beyond that because sometimes it can pop if you try to inject little more air. In some cases where you might not get an air bubble injection right in the first go uh, and especially in cases where the cornea is really thin in the center, it's a good idea not to debulk but go ahead and inject right away and here you will get a bubble but the chances of getting a bubble will depend on what level you're in. Here you can see you've got a bubble, you also can see that the Fleischer's ring that is there on the surface is very nicely visible that tells you that you've got the entire cone. Next thing that you need to do is you need to create an access to that area of the bubble. So I usually put viscoelastic and go into the stroma and release the air bubble so you can actually go into the uh, area of the uh, duas layer and uh, start excising your tissue. Uh, so that part actually uh, I'll probably skip because it is relatively uh, long. Here this is just the part where you excise the stromal tissue after reaching up to the duas layer. And after that uh, I use a 0.25 disparity for all keratoconus cases because these trifines give you a very precise measurement and uh, using more disparity will cause more myopia post-op. So 0.25 seems to work very well. You just need to remove the endothelium. You don't need to remove the desmase and peel it off. If you find that the desmase is coming off easily, you can do that. Otherwise, just scrape the endothelium and then you can put your tissue in and put your sutures without any problem. Uh, then suturing is really important, I'll talk about this shortly, but uh, also what is important is the kind of sutures. Uh, in keratoconus, especially if you have somebody with VKC, it's best to avoid continuous sutures because these sutures get loose very early. If there is no VKC, patient is older, you can put continuous sutures that gives you better outcomes. Some special situations like post intacts, if you are doing a DALC, actually this is an easier situation because you already have a channel made. So all you have to do is take the intacts out and then go into the area that you've uh, had your channel before itself and then inject your air bubble and usually you'll get a, a, a nice air bubble because you're already quite deep and you already have access to the area that is in the posterior stroma about 75 to 80% deep. Some cases where you might not get a big bubble and this again is typically in cases where patients have undergone uh, 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 high drops, they have a scar in the posterior surface. So if you try to inject a bubble, what you saw here is a blow through and you will actually have a break in the desk maze and you will not be successful after you do your surgery. In cases uh, who have undergone cross-linking, if you try to inject a bubble, a lot of times you will not get a big bubble because it seems as if the cornea is more compact. You might get small bubbles as you can see in this area and the bubble will refuse to expand beyond this. So in cases like this, it's important to debulk, go as deep as possible, try and do a manual dissection. But usually you will find one or two bubbles that are present deeper within the stroma. 
As you can see here, there is one small bubble that is present here. So I try and go and access that bubble. And once you access that bubble, usually you can go deep enough into the stroma and then dissect to ensure that you are in the correct plane and you will be able to get adequate depth so that you can uh, clear off the corneas. Here you can see uh, I've actually gone through the posterior stroma. I have uh, exposed the desmase membrane here as well, but I decided I'm not going to remove the duas. I'm going to continue and uh, complete my uh, surgery after that. So in uh, cases that you have a micro perforation, a lot of times you can salvage the dalk as well and you don't need to, con uh, to uh, convert to PK. This again, I'm not going to go through the entire video. It's relatively long, but you can use a manual dissection technique uh, instead of using a big bubble when you have a micro perforation right in the beginning of your dissection. The last segment of what I'm going to talk about, I think, is also very important. This is about what kind of sutures you use and the other important implications of what you will do in dark surgery. So if you have a graft like this, which is really nicely centered on the pupil, you will have very good visual acuity. This is the right eye of the patient, plus uh, 2.75 minus 3 with 20-25, almost all the sutures in, and you will see that this is probably because the graft is relatively large. Now, if you compare this with this patient who has a graft which is large as well, but is not centered on the pupil, and you'll see that this patient has a lot more hyperopia, patient is not getting good vision after surgery. So this is quite crucial because centration of your graft on the pupil, ensuring that their sutures are not too long, and also ensuring that the distance of the suture from the visual axis is lesser, will determine the kind of visual acuity that the patient will get postoperatively as well. So this is really important. If you look at this patient, this is pre-op keratoconus, relatively large cone. Post-op, you see that the graft size is relatively large. I've used continuous sutures here. And this is the other thing I'm doing right now. I'm always doing grafts that are eight or above in patients who have keratoconus. Typically, they have much better and quicker uh, uh, visual acuity uh, recovery. You see, this is 2020 in one month with very low astigmatism as well. And this is what continuous sutures will give you if the patient is old enough too. The other thing that is important in keratoconus because the periphery can be a little thick, you need to ensure that your sutures are deep enough so that you have good graft apposition. If you have good graft for junction apposition, your astigmatism also is going to be quite low after you do your surgery. Here you see in the inferior part of the graft hose junction, you see there is some ectasia and that is not desirable to have post-op. post dalk as well, you can do IOLs, you can do an ICL, you can do a toric IOL as well. This is a patient who had uh, almost uh, twen, uh, 12 to 13 diopters of astigmatism. So we used uh, Ultima Smart Toric IOL and she did really well with unaided vision of 20 by 30 after DALC. And this is good because you have very regular astigmatism after DALC surgery. Like Shreya spoke, you can also do a PRK post DALC and a topo guided treatment usually works very well here as well. And this is a patient who had relatively high cylinders, not correcting to 2020. After the first topo guided treatment, he had a reduction in cylinder and he was 20 by 20. He didn't want a second procedure, but he was happy with what he had. So to summarize, DALC does have ex uh, excellent outcomes in keratoconus. PK is equally good in case you convert. Vision recovery is good at about a month. Uh, you can use glasses, PRK or fakic IOL for astigmatism. But you should not forget that the patient has had a transplant and follow-up is really important unlike all other surgical modalities in keratoconus. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk, sir. Uh, before we close, we have a uh, keynote address by Dr. J.T. Lin on the recent progress of uh, corneal cross-linking. I invite Dr. J.T. Lin uh, to come forward with his talk, please. So I think uh, one of my biggest take-home points uh, from uh, Dr. PVK's talk was that... I'll just spend about 10 minutes and uh, report to you about the recent progress of the CXL. First, I'd like to outline, on this page, I have somehow outlined the past 32 years, all right? And uh, since the first uh, patient was done by, at that time, I think it's called PRK. And then, uh, depending on the areas you treated, so the technology has been go from the early RK, PRK, LASIK, and then the most recent one is called cross-linking. And as you see, cross-linking, uh, is one of the new technology, and uh, I show you the spectrum where cross-linking was at 365, it's called EVA, 
And UV has A, B, and C. So A is the longest. Actually, A is safer than B and C in terms of eye safety. Now, uh, the UVA is not only weapons can be used for cross linking. We'll, we'll discuss it more. There are other weapons like the green or even the NIR can be also used. However, different uh, photosynthesizers will be used if different from the EVA. All right. So this page outlines almost all the possible atomic lasers at different spectrum and with different applications. Now, the mechanism of the action of the CSL is I think the, I might actually use in this page to describe maybe easier, okay? Uh, okay, and the left hand side you got EV light, okay? Or could be visible, now in this case UV light, and you excite the, the, the solution to a, it's called T star, which is a triple star, all right? If you have a pointer, somehow I can point? Huh? This is a pointer or something? Yeah, okay. So the T star is called a triple state, and the triple state can couple to the, the abstract or M, which is monomer, okay? The CRS means you want to convert the monomer to a polynomial, okay? So actually this is a polymerization process, and uh, they are type one and type two, all right? And type one is going this way, all right? So you can see a direct coupling to the monomer and then uh, produce radical and possible with the oxygen or non oxygen become type one. Now type two, you always need the oxygen. Very important. Without the oxygen, it is you, you don't get a type two process. All right. So that's the mechanism type one and type two. Application of CX0, uh, there are so many, okay? And uh, at the beginning uh, the Ectexia, KC, and then there are some the also calling also applications, okay? And the more recent one is at the bottom, okay? We're going to get you some result about the bottom one. So I summarize again, there are at least five. The last one is called combined technology, okay? You combine the CS0 with other LASIK, ICRS, or femtosecond smiles, and so on. There are at least, at least about 14 plus CS0 techniques, okay? And typically you have to call epi off, epi on, and then with the, well, the thin corneal, you can use different uh, solution and uh, high power accelerate CS0, and also to enhance the diffusion, the Italian company invented a device called isotopins. You can enhance, you, instead of waiting 15 minutes, this one you only wait about five to six minutes. So which is good. And they are continuous assisted. I think there was an Indian doctor actually report this paper two years ago. And the, the, the most popular now is called Lex Extra or Lex Plus and topography guided PRK and so on. Now the, the also people are working on the, the command CS0 with the RGP. However, there are only very few pa paper pipes being published, about two or three. And the result is not very conclusive. Well, they, they didn't do it right. And, uh, and also possible to do the hyperopia. Now it used to be called a DLK or they, or they call a CK for the uh, hyperopia. Now the technology was out of date or people get out of that because of regression. Now it's possible if you can reduce the regression by command the CXL, there's another potential to, to go back to do the hyperopia. Okay, and this is the final second. And then people talk about uh, after the smile, you keep the stroma, don't throw away, put the eye bang, and later on, you might put it back, all right, but you cross the link in and reserve it. So those two are very new, okay? Not, nobody published that app. Okay, those are the list of the physical or chemical changes after the CS0, all right? So those are all increased, okay? Now the, this is summarized the possible myopia correction used to be loss one to five, now we have the potential reaching number six. For a small, maybe up to two diopter, all right? Cross-linking. Now, the series for myopia treatment, 
that's the one. For example, you get the k value from 30 to 43 to 41, and by the formula, k equals 337 divided by r1. So you can produce about one, one and a half diopters for a redu reduction of k two k values. All right, a simple formula. Now the the zero zero plus RCP, essentially you can serialize re the recipient. Now this one, now the uh, I think about two or three papers have been published. Okay, and the simple formula is here. For any one millimeter change of the axial length, you result to about two point five to three diopters. So that's good, pretty good. Okay, so we can somehow using C zero surprise the the axial length growth. You can surprise few diopters. The efficiency, I think I, I put the conclusion first all right, before you <laughs> get into the stream, okay? I, I talk about one, two, three, four, summarize the result, and I'll give you a little more detail. Now, oxygen, oxygen plays the major rule in type two, but not in type one, okay? This has been a debating issue, and most of the European people, they don't believe what I say, and, and American, they believe, you know, there, there are two, two kind of argument now, okay? Do we need oxygen or not? And then the, the process is type one or type two dominate. Okay, I think it's still an open question now. Number two, efficiency is not just the efficiency. Say how much, say, k value change or, or, or diopters. Essentially, you also consider how much depth you can do the cross linking. So not only you have to get efficiency plus the depth you can cross link. And you, you need to go to at least about 200 micron to get a, the efficiency, all right? Now, and also the classical, I call classical versus mountain protocol. The classical protocol means you said 15 years ago, the Dresden protocol, three millimeter, and then low power and so on. I think the classical protocol make a major serious mistake. We're gonna talk about it later, okay? They put too much reference during the EV exposure. Now people start to realize that's, that's wrong. During the UV, you should not put, keep adding all the red frame in on, on the corner. That will block out your UV energy. So we are wasting a lot of dust, okay? And I'll go give you a little more detail on what the modern protocol suggests. And also the, the regular is called BR, BR error, everybody know this, this law. That was back, back into almost 200 years ago. The PRA allows that any biological effect to a, a light is determined by the dose only, okay? And therefore, for the same dose, intensity increase, the erasing time will be decreased. Now, this is not true now, okay? And the secondly, they call beer lambda law in the zero zero process also evaded, okay? So I somehow, uh, I think I, I challenge on both BRL and BRL. Okay? They take about 200 years to figure out these two laws have certain limitations. The, you talk about the, this is maybe too much equations, okay? But anyway, the, there, are, there are almost 10 factors can influence in the CSR efficiency, efficacy, okay? So I put a notation including the absorption and the concentration, the light intensity, the, the erasing time energy, and also the damage threshold, the depth oxygen, the fusion rate, and so on, okay? Now the safety dose was defined by, by the, everybody talking about 400 micron minimum, which is no longer true now. As you know, there are many published papers, they go all the way down to about 220 or 250 micron, still safe, okay? So the, the, 400 micron minimum corner depth plus 5.4 uh, maximum dose is no longer uh, true, all right? That has been known for about uh, 10, 15 years, and nobody challenged on that, okay? Okay, the minimum corner thickness, as I, as I, I presented, this published in the first one, it, it depends on the dose you use and also the threshold damage, okay? So this G, not necessarily 400 micron. It also depends on the concentration, okay? Let us say you use a 0.1% or 0.25%, the safety corneal thickness is different, okay? Now the efficiency could be type one this, in this case, and, and the formula saying that 
the concentration high, you get a, you get more efficient. However, the higher intensity, you actually get a low steady state efficacy. Now, this is very important. This is why accelerate CL zero is not as efficient as the, the low intensity CL zero. Okay, I hope you, you realize this. Okay, the higher intensity, the steady state efficiency actually go down. That means a thirty milliwatt day uh, intensity will not be as effective as three milliwatt. Okay. However, there's a way to compensate that. I will talk about that. Okay. How much time we have? Five more minutes? Three minutes? Huh? Okay. Slightly past time, sir. But uh, if you okay. can give me yes, two more minutes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. So this is the the my theory predict if efficiency efficacy proportional to the concentration. Okay. And there are some clinical data supporting this. Okay. So therefore everybody using the point one percent which will only be as effective as point two five. Okay, there are a lot of paper published this. However, you cannot keep going on, there are some where you saturate. So it's not necessary that they consider the higher the better, okay? All right, I'll move fast. Okay, that's my modern protocol published uh, February 2018 in IOBS, okay? For example, I'll give you two examples. That's you use 80 minute watt, you should do this. In between about two minutes, you put some drop, okay, and finish. And for the higher power, you put more drop during, okay? Now before the dressing protocol tell you what, during the period, they, they, they put three or four times sourcing continuously, that's wrong. Okay, that actually is not optimized, okay? So those two examples are optimized, can you, how do you, when and where you put the eye drop, more eye drop, okay? Now you do the LAC extra is different. You only do the pre-op sourcing, and during the, the, the irradiation, you don't, you don't do anything at all, just finish, okay? I think the, I need to, Stop here, and then there are more. Okay, this one I show you two examples. One is for the human. It's called PAC. Okay, PAC. You know, the, the you know every sort of keratotis. And the second one, actually, we have a we have a, we, a design using for the animals also. Okay, this is human data and this animal. All right. Uh, right now, I summarize that the USA, Europe. In Asia and including the Apasami, you know, they are here, and all those uh, the maker for the devices, and the pricing could be anywhere between 3000 to 60000 And there are two pen type devices, the one in Taiwan and there's one in Italy, and they think this could be attached to the street brand and for the future need. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lin. Yeah. Thank you all for yeah. Stayed back for till the very end, uh, fag end of the evening. Thank you.